I'm here with South Bend Mayor and Presidential Candidate Pete Buttigieg, and I know what you're thinking, but no, we're not going to fight. I bet you're wondering how we got here. Well, I wrote an article calling Pete Buttigieg a lying MF. It went viral. He called and asked for a face-to-face, so of course, I showed up. So tell me, when you first heard the, well, read the article that I wrote, uh, tell me what was the first thing that ran through your mind and what you wanted to say to me. Well, other than the headline, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I wanted to engage with you because uh, I I recognized the truth of what you were talking about, especially in terms of the structural barriers that are facing students of color across this country. And uh, I know that, or I believe that you were responding to the fact that what I was talking about didn't really account for that at all. And you can't have a conversation, and we shouldn't have a conversation about education, in particular educational disparities affecting black kids, Mm -hmm. without talking about the consequences of institutional racism, both in terms of what's happening directly in the K through 12 context, but also all the other things that are connected to it. And so uh, I could have done without the headline, but I also recognized uh, a point of view I really respected in the article, and it was one of the reasons I wanted to talk. So what do you, what do you say to the people, uh, some of your supporters and people nationwide who said you were right, uh, who believe that black parents or role, lack of role models are responsible for the education disparity? Well, here's the part that, that I do think we need to talk about. There is gross underrepresentation, uh, for example, among teachers uh, of black professionals. Mm-hmm. So we know that when a, a black student has a black teacher or uh, many black teachers, they are more likely to succeed. Uh, we know that that's an issue. And I also think because of institutional racism, the kind of, the kind of quiet assurance or confidence that white middle class folks sometimes have that going through the steps that have been laid out in front of them is going to work out is not always there for black and brown students. So I think that part uh, deserves to be taken seriously. I think what you pointed out was that I was, uh, first of all, I may not have elegantly pointed to that issue in that way, but also that's only part of the story. Uh, We're also talking about the fact that we're one of the few countries where when you have kids in more economic need, Uh, who are disproportionately black and brown, uh, they would get fewer resources. Most countries have got an area where students need more. They're going to get higher spending per pupil. That's an issue. The fact that a lot of school segregation is the consequence of neighborhood segregation, which we treat as de facto without acknowledging that there were policy decisions, not just long ago, very distant things, but within living memory, like FDR era policy decisions that took neighborhoods that actually were relatively integrated at the beginning of the 20th century for the simple reason that people had to walk to factories where uh, black and white employees worked side by side and contributed to their segregation because of how federal housing funding worked. So, so, so while we're talking about segregation, you recently said that, you know, you, didn't, you recently realized how segregated uh, South Bend schools were. And I know that you attended a, a school that was a private school, I think, now the uh, average tuition there is eight thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and I think those kinds of of choices are what uh, white parents and middle class parents get to have. And you know, South Bend schools are still disproportionately black. What mm-hmm. do you see? What do you say to the people who say, "Well, South Bend schools are still segregated," and how can a person who couldn't fix the schools in the city where he was mayor fix the schools nationwide? Right. So the point I, I'm making there is that South Bend schools are desegregated by court order. But if you're only looking at the law or you're only working within the boundaries of the city, then you're missing the consequences of the way the districts were drawn. Uh, now, schools are the most important thing that a mayor doesn't control in our system in Indiana. But I didn't take that sitting down and just ignore opportunities to uh, encourage and support uh, public school students, both with partnering with the school system directly when we could, but also trying to tackle some of these underlying issues. Look, we know that so much of what a kid is up against is what happens before they go through the doors of the school and after they leave. And that we knew we could do a lot about. So you look at things like the, the programming that the city runs out of the Martin Luther King Junior Recreational Center, for example, that provides the kind of mentorship and wraparound that maybe there hasn't always been Uh, resources for in the school building, but we know is going to benefit public school students. We supported that. But you also are the mayor 
in a town where, for instance, uh, nationwide African American students are three and a half times more likely to be suspended, and the same is true for South Bend uh, School Corporation. That sixty-two percent of the out-of-school suspensions were for black and brown kids, despite you know the schools being made up of thirty-two uh, percent black kids and white parents seem to be fleeing South Bend schools. You know the, the schools are disproportionately white, and again, there are people who wonder how you can attack those problems in a country when those problems haven't been fixed in a city where you've been in control. So I think the, the question is, are we asking for somebody who has ended racism and segregation and disparities in, in a city uh, or anywhere in the country? And if so, I'd like to meet them. Or are we talking about the work that we've done side by side, not to end any one of these problems, but to dramatically improve them? I'm proud of the fact that black poverty fell by more than half on my watch, faster than the city and faster, faster sorry, than the state and than the country without pretending that that makes me a miracle worker or uh, waving away the fact that there's still a tremendous disparity, not only in income, but especially in wealth in our city. I think the point is that we have got to have a level of resolve and intention and resources to attack these issues. And I understand the skepticism of voters in general and in particular of black voters when somebody comes along, especially a newer political figure and says, I got it figured out, here I come. The idea is not to make a promise that we can't keep, but to talk about what I believe we must do nationally. Right. And it's rooted in the successes and my understanding of the failures that we have lived with in my hometown too. So, so let's talk about those uh, your plan, right? right. So uh, let's talk about the Douglas plan. It's ambitious mm -hmm. and it seems comprehensive, but uh, how many of those policies that you outlined in, in the Douglas plan have you put in action in the South? So a lot of them rhyme with our experience in South Bend. But the idea is, look at what we can do with the powers of the presidency and a president who can say but, but upon arrival. But is essentially the president. In many the ways, yes. So, so let me tell you about some of the rhymes, for example. So part of the Douglas plan is about housing. And we know that uh, part of the problem we have right now is that folks have been redlined into certain neighborhoods and then face the risk of being gentrified out of them uh, when they become desirable. So in South Bend, we took action to make sure that we were investing in repairing homes or removing crumbling homes, often with out-of-town landlords, uh, where they were harming the homes next door to them of disproportionately black and low-income residents who had been forced to live with them for years and wondered whether the city just didn't care because as long as I had been alive, these houses had been building up. So we made the investment, we made the improvement, we made an impact. In a different but related way, it's what the Douglas Plan calls for, with a 21st Century Homestead Act that empowers people to build home equity in the neighborhoods that they've been redlined into before they get pushed out of them. So whether it's that, I mean, another example would be uh, around business support. So a huge part of what we've got to deal with here is the need for economic empowerment. Now, the way we did it in South Bend was, first of all, supporting the cultivation of small businesses. So a city-supported resource center, for example, with physical resources, but also business resources and mentorship for people trying to get businesses off the ground in a historically black neighborhood. So, so I'd like to talk about that, right? Yeah. Because I think economic empowerment is important. And, you know, I read a City of South Bend's disparity report. It says yeah. that from 2015 to 17, the city, city literally spent zero dollars on black businesses I mean, in the city contracts, which is almost unbelievable, but it also seems to undermine exactly the thing that you just said to me. Well, here's the thing. So first of all, I ordered up that audit because I knew we would need it under the laws of Indiana but in order to... You weren't spending... No, but here's why we needed it. Of course we knew we knew that it was disproportionate. But here's why we needed well, not to... Not disproportionate, not existent, right? Within that category of right. spending. I'm just to be clear, I was looking at a certain category of spending. Which and what they found business. what? And what they found was 3% of businesses that could have done that work were black owned. Um, but you're right, in that category of contracts, uh, none of our business went to that 3%. So what do we do about it? Well, because we had that audit, and I knew it wasn't going to look yeah. great politically, but having that audit gave me the power under Indiana law to sign into law concrete targets for what the city can do in order to elevate with specific goals our purchasing with minority and women-owned businesses. So it meant taking a step that was politically inconvenient 
but doing it in order to make sure that the city then had the power. Remember, when I took office, we didn't even keep the data that would have let us find that out. So I created an executive order, established a diversity and inclusion office, brought somebody in, funded them to do the work, set up the disparity study that, that you're describing, and then uh, worked with our local legislators to build a law around it in order to do the kind of purchasing that we could be doing at a much higher level at the federal government. Uh, matter of fact, our Douglas plan calls for a 25% target. The one at home is set at 14% because that's the most that we can show there's availability right now. But we also shouldn't take the availability sitting down, right? Why are only 3% of businesses in that field? And we got to take responsibility for fixing that. Don't you think that it might be 3% in that category? Because like, who would start a business if you knew that your city government wouldn't? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's chicken and egg. But that's why we got to take responsibility for working on both ends of the problem. So, yeah, we set the targets, but also what are we doing to make sure that more businesses get set up that way in the first place? And I think that it's not enough to say, oh, well, there aren't that many black owned businesses in this field. So too bad. I think we also have to accept responsibility for that capacity building to happen. Right. And we've done both of those things locally. And imagine what we can do if we were more serious with the powers of the presidency. And with the federal government to do well, that. But you also have to recognize that. Imagine what you could have done if you would have done that as mayor the first year you were in office, right? Well, we were working on a lot of things my first year, but we started working on this in my first term as well. Right. So and let's talk about some of the things that you were working on uh, since your first year, specifically criminal justice reform, mm-hmm. right? You announced in South Carolina that 400 South, Carolina, South Carolinians endorsed your plan mm-hmm. when, you know, 42% of those people were white. Mm-hmm. Uh, why not just list black people we've talked to? Mm-hmm. Like, why not just say, look, these are the black people that we've talked to? Because we know South Carolina's prison population mm-hmm. is disproportionately mm-hmm. black. And what well, disproportionately black, not very brown, just black. Mm-hmm. So why not go specifically just to black voters and ask them? I think that's a good idea. And one of the things we're doing is focusing on conversations with black voters and elevating black voices among the people who we're working to earn the support of and, and the people who are working with us all along. So let's talk about uh, criminal justice in the form of police violence. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've been asked about this police officer, Aaron Kepler, who's a uh, mm-hmm. who's been uh, a police officer and accused of misconduct since 2014. Mm-hmm stayed on the force and eventually ended up being involved in the killing of a black man. And, uh, you know, you said that you don't have the power to fire a police officer. Well, who has that power in mm-hmm. South Right. So the way it works is we have a board of safety. It's a civilian board. Mm-hmm. I appoint the members of that board and they hold hearings in public when there are serious discipline issues. So when you have uh, termination, suspension, these kinds of things. That is something that takes place. It's almost like a trial. And I've made sure that we have diverse representation. Matter of fact, at the moment, that board is majority black and made sure that citizens and residents are empowered to see and participate in what's going on in that process. Well, too. If they were empowered, it seems that, you know, there have been protests against mm-hmm. this police officer, this specific police mm-hmm. officer, for five years mm-hmm. before he was fired. You know, if it was me and I really cared about this issue and I saw this. So just to correct, this not, uh, I believe the officer you're talking about has not been fired. Right, right. Um, well, but there have been proceedings and, and I think there have been discipline cases. So yeah. why not say in 2015 after mm-hmm. people start calling for him to be uh, let go, let's get rid of the people who keep him employed on that system of people. Well, I think that's where we got to go through the actual cases and look at the evidence because a lot of the reporting has been... Uh, uh, let's say it's glossed over a lot of what's going on, but that process continues. And in this current case you're talking about, I called for an outside investigation. That's going on. And I'm going to let that investigation play out. It might be politically smart for me to do something else, but I know the right thing to do is to allow that investigation to happen. And meanwhile, we haven't waited for that investigation to come back, to take more steps working side by side with folks in the community in order to make sure that there's a sense of confidence that the police department's heading in the right direction. Look, uh, this is a problem. This is not new. And uh, we have taken a lot of steps to do things about it. Civil rights training, implicit bias training, enhanced transparency, working to reduce use of force. But like some of these other issues, we haven't solved it. We've had some things that became even more challenging, like recruiting. 
Uh, we had the incident this year with the police shooting that right. you mentioned. Uh, and so we know that there is more work to do. Right. So you speaking specifically to black voters, mm -hmm. um, what are you, what message are you trying to get to them? And what are you trying to get from black voters aside from votes? Like, what are you trying to learn yeah. about and what are you trying to seek out in having these conversations? Well, the real conversation I want to have, of course, first of all, it's, it's my job running for office to make sure that I earn the support of black voters. But the, the deeper need right now, I think, is to make sure that my campaign and all of American politics is more responsive to the need to deliver equality in this country. Because systemic racism and white supremacy in particular I believe is the force that is most likely to destroy the United States of America. And so part of the conversation I'm having is with black voters who usually ask me one of two questions, one of two kinds of questions. How's my life going to be different if you're president, right? What's your vision for black America around voting or health or education or income or whatever? And the other question is, who are you? Right? How I know that you're serious about any of the stuff you say, either based on your story in South Bend or based on what's inside you. So that's a conversation that I'm having with black voters. I'm also, frankly, having a conversation with white voters about why dealing with white supremacy can't just be a black issue or an issue that candidates of color talk about or an issue that white candidates talk about only when we're talking with black voters. Because earlier today, we were at the, at the memorial here in Montgomery, and it was a reminder of the connection between what has happened at the earliest moments of this country's founding and what is going on right now. And I'm convinced that if we don't wrestle down white supremacy in our lifetime, that it could kill the American project so, in our lifetime. So do you think that you have a record of fighting white supremacy? Because you, I mean, you know, black voters hear this from candidates or something similar every election cycle. Do you think that you have the record of fighting white supremacy and inequality that black voters can, even if they didn't hear from you mm -hmm. directly, can look at and say, this is a guy that's going to work for us. Yes, I believe I've shown that I work to do the right thing at every turn. Doesn't mean we've got it perfect. Doesn't mean I've had it all figured out. Um, but I will seek to explain everything that I've done up to now and everything that I propose to do nationally in the same context. Uh, to try to make it clear, not just what I propose to do, but, but why I care and why this is important. Because my city's hurting, too, because yeah. of this. Uh, voters have said that black voters are resistant to you because of uh, homophobia in black communities. Yeah. How do you answer that? How, do you think that's what you've experienced, or do you think there are other problems? I think it is, it is wrong to pin homophobia on the black community or any community. Homophobia is a problem. And it is in every part of our society. But suggesting that that is unique to the black community, uh, I think, is dead wrong. And the challenges that we have right now as a country, I think, compel people on, every, on the wrong side of every different pattern of exclusion. And they are very, very different, just to be very clear. I'm not equating the experience of being LGBT with the experience of being discriminated uh, against because of race. I'm not even comparing them. But whether it's those patterns of exclusion or others around national origin, around religion, around gender, around disability that are happening in this country, this is a moment where more than ever, we have to identify the ways in which people who have been excluded have been pitted against each other by media narratives, by politics, by this White House, whatever it is. And this is a moment where we have to defeat that. And you look in particular uh, at the kinds of issues we were discussing when I had the chance to visit Reverend Barber's mm -hmm. church about the ways that low-income Americans and poor people are pitted against each other. The suffering of poor white people because of policies that went into place partly because of racial voter suppression, to take just one example. And what this shows us is the need for a kind of solidarity right now among different people who have had different experiences in this country, but who have a shared interest in making sure that the American experience is one of belonging. Belonging, not exclusion. That's okay. what I'm about. And I think the way we respond to narratives like that is a really important part of how we overcome that. So I want to thank you for uh, taking this time out to talk face-to-face. -to -face. 
And I want to ask you the last question, which is the most important question yeah. in our community is, uh, you here in Montgomery, salt or sugar on grits? Ooh, I didn't know sugar was an option. Right, yes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs>